This week on Quadriga, terror in Turkey, who is to blame? A bomb attack on a peace demonstration in the Turkish capital Ankara killed almost 100 people and has worsened the country's political crisis. Elections are planned for November 1st. Criticism of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his governing AKP party has grown loud. The opposition claims the AKP is at least partially responsible for stoking division and chaos. Is Turkey on the brink of civil war? Coming to you from Berlin, Quadriga, the international debate. Your host this week, Peter Craven. Yes, hello and a very warm welcome indeed to this latest edition of Quadriga coming to you from the heart of the German capital, Berlin. And today we're looking at the grave tensions in Turkey. The question we're asking, you've already heard, is terror in Turkey, who is to blame? And to discuss all this, I'm joined in the studio by three excellent analysts. I'd like to introduce them to you straight off. Beginning with Alan Posner, who is an Anglo-German author and regular commentator for the Berlin-based newspaper Die Welt. Alan says some people would like to see civil war in Turkey, including Kurdish and Islamic terrorists, possibly elements of the military. In this situation, the elected and legitimate government deserves support. Also with us today is Malta Liming. He's the head of the op-ed pages at another Berlin daily, the Tagesspiegel. And Malta says Turkey and its ruling AK party is fighting four wars at the same time against Islamic State, the PKK, the refugees, and against losing its majority in the upcoming elections. Turkey, he believes, is increasingly vulnerable to regional turmoil and risks further destabilization. And a very warm welcome indeed to Dea Akal, who is a freelance journalist who's worked in the Turkish capital, Ankara, as a correspondent for ver various newspapers and TV channels. She's currently working at DW at the Turkish desk here. Welcome, Dea. She says Turkey is highly unpredictable and Western support is vital. So, is Turkey on the brink of civil war? That's the question on everybody's lips. And uh, reflecting that mood, Dea, we had one Turkish commentator coming out this week uh, saying, Turkey has never been so deeply divided as it is today. What are your contacts in Turkey telling you about the latest situation? Well, the Turkish society is socially and politically um, polarised. Uh, fragmented. Uh, it's a difficult uh, period for Turkey and there are a lot of fears, of course. I mean, um, domestically there is tension in the neighbourhood of Turkey, there is a high tension. Uh, things are happening quite quickly. We couldn't have uh, foreseen that it would come to this point where Turkey would get um, a twin bomb attack in the capital city of, uh, of one of the most important NATO allies. It's very dangerous where Turkey is moving on and uh, it's up to the leadership in, the Tur in Turkey and the political leaders in Turkey to, to stop this uh, tension and to find a way to uh, for a consensus uh, and a peaceful solution for this tension and it, it must stop as soon as possible. Okay, that's a good, broad, rational assessment yeah. of the situation. I'm grateful to you for that, but I'd like to know, yeah, I'd like to know about your personal emotions because anybody who's spent any time in Turkey recently, up to, up to about a year ago, it was a country that was mainly peaceful, it was largely thriving, it was looking more to the future than to the past, and a lot of that seems to be lost and a lot more could be lost. How angry does that make you personally? Well, of course, I'm um, I'm disturbed. I am angry um, because of several reasons. To be honest, I'm angry because um, Turkey is a div diverse society, and you have different opinions, which is healthy, which is normal. You have it in all Western countries, but when you start to radicalize certain um, ideologies, and when politicians um, contribute to that uh, radicalization, then uh, people like us uh, start to think. Well, well, what are the means to stop it? You know, we're journalists, um, and uh, the only thing we can do is to inform the public on certain issues and what is going on. And when you don't have that means anymore to inform the public, then and when only radical voices are being heard, then radical people uh, find a way to just uh, strengthen their voice, and you start to hear them. Mm. So you you start to be desperate and you want to say something and that's what the rally maybe was about. Uh, yes, it was, uh, it was about, it was a peace rally, 
Mm-hmm. So, so when you see that that rally got attacked, I would not say that you know AKP or the government is responsible of that attack, but the government has the responsibility to protect pluralism. It has the duty to protect demonstrators, demonstrators, and, and people who who want to speak out. So that's my problem. That's okay, so where that's I the get... responsibility for the government. Alan Posner said in his, I quoted your introductory remarks of yours, talking about the legitimacy of the Turkish government. Is there any question for you whatsoever that this is the legitimate government of, of Turkey at this point in time? No. Well, uh, look, if this was a normal development, we'd, we'd be talking in Turkey about the result of the, you know, the aftermath of the Gaza Park protests, of the victory of the pro-Kurdish uh, party in the last election against Erdogan, and the fact that change was probably going to happen and a change for the better. But these are not normal times. Um, and so, unfortunately, we can't talk about the fact that Erdogan, who I feel has t- his time was and is running out, he's under, uh, uh, under immense pressure, uh, as Malta Leeming said, from the refugees pouring in over two million, from uh, IS, Islamic State, who are probably behind this attack, um, from the PKK, who have mounted attacks on Turkish police at this, at the very, and and soldiers at the very moment when Turkey is in this crisis. And therefore, you know, instead of talking about, as I would like to talk about, you know, in any other circumstances, about the illegitimacy of Mr. Erdogan, uh, I feel myself bound uh, uh, to talk about the fact that as of today, as now, he is the legitimate leader, legitimate president, his government, the AK party. Surely in arguing this way, we are we are binding ourselves to another strong man in the region, like as we have done in the past with Bashar al-Assad, with Saddam Hussein, with Muammar Gaddafi. Well, you, and you, but you can't compare uh, Erdogan, who is a modernizer of, of, of Turkey and Islam, as a matter of fact, and who has done so much for his country before he turned Who has in recent times been responsible Responsible for media blackouts and for pressure on journalists, pressure on the judiciary, and so on. And it's so true, forth. but no one denies that the last election was a free and fair election, and in no way can he be compared to, to, to really evil people like Mr. Uh, Assad or, 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 or uh, um, Muammar al Gaddafi, or even the uh, Egyptian strongman al Sisi. None of them has a mandate comp- comparable to that of Mr. Erdogan. Malta. I think the, it, it, it's quite unfortunate that we have to speak about the, the global, the terrorist or the war problems and now facing an election. Facing an election for, for Erdogan, it was quite humiliating, losing with the AKP uh, in the last election the, the absolute majority. But he did not do any effort, not a real effort to form a coalition government. And that is what usually the electorate asked with these outcomes. If there is no majority, just try to find a partner and try to make compromise and and play it the democratic way. From the beginning, from day one, it was clear for the AKP we are looking for for re-election, and we try to we try to make the surrounding and all the um, the atmosphere in the public so that it will this will not happen again. And this is quite unfortunate because this is his election aim, which is a legitimate aim to get the, to get the absolute majority. But given that it was the, the desperation after the last election result, I think that's a very, very bad sign for Turkish society right now. So um, it's very unfortunate we have to face it. And I, I just hope that after November 1st, after that election, things internally will calm down a little bit mm. so that the country faced with all these uh, problems that are much bigger than the internal problems uh, can really face them. Who's, who's to blame for the explosion? Nearly 100 people dead, maybe more than 100 people dead. Who is to blame for those explosions? Well, it's probably ISIS. I mean, the the Turkish uh, security apparatus have... Do you share this view? Um, um, No one took responsibility. I mean, uh, it's it's, it's quite interesting because uh, the Surich attack, where 33 young people died, no one took responsibility. We only know that uh, usually ISIS takes responsibility. Yes, and we only yeah. we only know that uh, the two uh, suicide bombers uh, had links 
to ISIS, um, but we don't know who is behind it, and I think we will never know it. it I the, mean... the reason I'm asking is because a lot of people have said, and you effectively said so, Malta Leming, uh, you, yourself just now, that uh, that the, the the election result was so humiliating for President Erdogan uh, that he then had to rethink. He had to come up with a plan B, with another strategy, and that was uh, a strategy for the destabilization of Turkey. And this, this is the reason, you're looking very sceptical, Alan, but this I is, this is the reason why many Kurds suspect yes. that people in the government or people behind the government, the deep state, as it's called, might be responsible. Well, look, first, the deep state isn't behind the government. The deep state is behind the old Kemalist um, elite. Uh, Erdogan has spent much of his time fighting deep state, not always with um, legitimate means, it has to be said. So that's the first thing. If deep state is behind it, it's against Erdogan. What possible interest could he have in legitimizing basically his opponents? I mean, the de Democratic the, uh, Party, which was behind this, um, uh, this, this rally, uh, by, 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 su by such means. He, he can't. This is obviously intended to destabilize not the country, but the government. Um, this is an attack on Erdogan himself. And to turn that round, that's, that's a conspiracy theory which I think really belong... I don't know who's... You know, the, so, the Kurd elements in the Kurdish party... The Kurdish marchers were chanting, you know, you know what they were chanting yeah, you know, in yeah, response yeah, we are to... Well, I, yeah. I think that there's, there's... I mean, I mean uh, Demirtas, HDP chef, um, is accusing the government of not taking necessary steps to protect them. So he's not... He's saying, you know, he's not directly saying you did this bombing, but I think we could elaborate on collusion. You know, it, it happens that some security officials, officials from time to time just don't see or look for their own ideological reasons. It may ha have happened. Happened. Uh, obviously, there's a lack of security. But um, saying that, uh, you know, the, the Akip, it, it harmed Erdogan. It is a blow for his, you know, his, his sovereignty. So Erdogan's position has been weakened by this attack and not strengthened by this Definitely. attack. That is your conclusion. You're nodding as well. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you can't, you can't blame a government for not stopping terrorist attacks. Look what's happening in Israel now. Look, look what happened at the Boston bombing. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, the FBI did, made some mistakes in the Boston bombing, but basically, and this is why I think IS is probably not taking responsibility, they may not be so directly responsible. You know, the new form of terrorism is, you know, go it alone, build a bomb and blow someone up. And the organization who inspired that may not even know that this is happening. Um, you know, so this may be a terror cell which affiliates itself with IS, although IS doesn't know it. This is, and you can't, you know, governments can't protect yes, us I would, from I would every... agree on that. I think we don't have any privileged knowledge about yes. who were the perpetrators about that. Okay. So speculating about this is quite hard, but we can talk about probabilities. Mm -hmm. We can talk about probabilities, and I would very much agree the, the, the most probable thing is that IS is behind the attack. Um, what they expect and what kind of effect it has. Sometimes these things change. First of all, there might be a kind of, of solidarity with the victims, first of all. That was the first reaction. Then who is to blame not giving the security? Maybe Erdogan, maybe not. Maybe the, the after effect will be he might come out stronger because many people think that's not the time we can allow ourselves to change government because we need a strong man and Erdogan is still supposed to be the strong man of the country. So that might be the after effect of this at all, but we are still on the speculative side. Okay, let's change the subject a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about Germany's role in all this because uh, Germany has obviously got a, a very large Turkish German population, but that's not the only reason why Germany uh, uh, can be concerned about what's going on in Turkey and in the region at this point in time. Let's have a look. Relations between Germany and Turkey have traditionally been close. More people of Turkish extraction live in Berlin than in any other city outside Turkey's borders. And Turkish culture has left a big mark on German urban centers. And the current tensions in Turkey are also now affecting life for the diaspora. On a recent visit to Germany, President Erdogan was greeted by enthusiastic crowds of expatriate supporters. But opponents, especially ethnic Kurds, also demonstrated against him on German streets. Could violence soon break out in Germany as well? 
that's a good question, isn't it? We'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. I'd like to begin this sequence by talking about uh, Frau Merkel's, Chancellor Merkel's visit to uh, Turkey this weekend. Is she going to be a welcome visitor? Yes, of course. I think um, both Erdogan and Davutoglu see the need to talk with their uh, Western allies. Mm -hmm. There has been a period where relations were, weren't as much, as, as close as it was wished by both sides, actually. Germany had other problems, the Greece um, uh, economic crisis, Ukraine. Turkey had its own problems and Turkey wasn't able to, to communicate its problems to Europe. So there was a lack of uh, dialogue, lack of confidence, which led to lack of confidence. And I think both sides have accepted now that there is a need for a strong dialogue and communication. Merkel met Davutoglu in New York mm -hmm. later on in just in Prime one Minister week. Davutoglu. Uh, Prime Minister mm -hmm. Davutoglu. Then she met um, uh, President Erdogan in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And now she's meeting both of them again. So this is, this is really important what is going on right now. Uh, both sides have decided to have a close bilateral relationship, a bilateral dialogue, which was necessary for a long time. And uh, I think everyone is looking forward to see uh, a rapprochement, at least a dialogue, if not any conclusion. A deal, I'm... a deal. I think that's <laughs> that's what they, yeah, but... I think that's what the German side really is working on. But I have doubts that it will happen so quickly because Turkey has its own ex uh, expectations. Turkey wants something to happen in Syria and before that. Mm -hmm. But the Germans desperately need uh, Turkey to be a closed yeah. floodgate to the tide, the, 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 fl the flow of refugees through Turkey, mainly from Syria. Is Germany going to get that? Is that I, what I, this is all about? I would say, I mean, seeing that from the, from the Turkish point of view, since, since a couple of years, I think the Turk, many Turks felt disappointed with Europe. They felt, I would not say isolated, but neglected by, by Europe. And um, so the refugee crisis gives the government an opportunity to show again its value. Uh, located, and, and many people who are, who are not Turkish just sometimes forget that Turkey is bordering Iran, Iraq, Syria. And, and for that reason, and, and, and the Kurds in that region uh, as well. So it is a very, very huge, until now very stable player, NATO ally disappointed as well with the United States because they were asked for quite a while to be much more stricter with the IS people, which they weren't, and, and sometimes even supporting them, going mm -hmm. into uh, Syria and eye. fighting them. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's now the time for them, with the refugee crisis, to come back on the table and show how important they are. But, so I, I, I don't want to say they're instrumentalizing instrumental this, but uh, on the other hand, it is. Um, it is his tool right now. Do I understand correctly, Alan? Germany, re Germany wants to keep as many of the refugees, the Syrian refugees, somewhere in and around Turkey as possible. And in doing so, what Germany is doing is keeping them close to a war zone, keeping them close to a potential civil war, at least a, ha a country haunted by a civil war, and often in refugee camps where there's not even enough to eat. Is that what Germany wants at this point in time? I think Germany <laughs> wants to keep them close to Syria, definitely. Um, and... Uh, this would be cynical in the way you suggest, as long as t Syria remains a war zone. Now, Mr. Erdogan has for years, honestly, years, demanded that NATO create a no-fly zone in northern Syria along his border in which these refugees could actually be housed, f give themselves a life, a life without being... Uh, uh, subject to Mr. Assad's barrel bombs, and NATO has done nothing in that respect to help Turkey, so they're within Turkey um, under very precarious situation. And I think, really, it's our time to deliver, quite honestly. But we um, are, to, we are to, The US is delivering, the French are delivering, the, the, the no, Brits are did, delivering in the form of, of, of rocket fire well, of ground forces. That's all very well, but we have to do more. We, the least we can do is to envisage a, a no-fly zone. And this has not become easier because of Russia's engagement. That's all the more reason to do it now. All the more reason. Why should Turkey have to suffer Russian jets I I approaching it and, and crossing its territory and not be supported by the organisation which is there to support them, NATO? I really think this is the time for Europe to deliver first. And then we'll see that Turkey will and can deliver, precisely because it's a fairly authoritarian state. I, I, I think the maybe even bigger task is to su support Turkey in, in, in giving more assistance to the refugees. That, and, and, and the difference is, I mean, they, they don't have a good life in Turkey. They might, some of them even have a miserable life, but they are safe. 
they are safe in Turkey and not hurt by the Syrian war, not hurt by the rockets and, and, and the bombs and things in the war zone. So that's basically what they fled from. So, but you have much more, they need much more support. They need to get their children out in school in Turkey, which most of them can't, uh, so that, that we don't talk about a lost generation. So that's, I think, is the task of the Europeans that they are looking on quite now. talking about to, money. About money, a lot of money. I don't think, yeah. I would like to add something. You know, um, it's, it's quite interesting. The, the diplomatic traffic between Berlin and Ankara and Brussels is mainly focused on this financial aid. Um, but when you look at it from a, another perspective, or you, when you try to look at it from another perspective, it's very important. I mean, uh, this war, it's not a Syrian war anymore. It's a proxy, multi-proxy war where a lot of uh, global powers have... It's a battlefield. So when you're a part of that battlefield, you have to be the part, a part of the solution as well. Uh, and I think Merkel, Merkel's statement and uh, her approach related to the refugees is really very important. And I think uh, w when she said that, you know, these people, they need a, a, a home free of fear and terror is, is crucial. And well, where do they, where will they have that home? Will it be in Turkey or in Germany or in Europe? And both sides are just, you know, saying, trying to, they, they talk about burden shifting each other, you know, Germany to, uh, to to Turkey, Turkey to Germany, but now I think they realize that they have to share the burden. So I think um, the negotiations are being quite productive as far as far as we heard. But the crucial point is that we have elections in Turkey. Erdogan and the government might use this as a you know visa liberalization. Um, uh, they might use it because it would help them, but we have to look whether Turkey would implement those actions. Sure, sure. You know, I have doubts with that implementation. OK, we're going to move on. We've talked about... Well, one, you can't talk about Turkey, as we have already done, without talking about the situation in Syria. It's unbelievably complex. Let's have a quick look. Recep Tayyip Erdogan has involved his country heavily in the war in Syria. The Turkish president used to be friends with Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. Now Erdogan wants him out of power. Friends of Turkey, like NATO and the U.S., are more interested in battling IS. Which is why they're supporting the Kurds, who are fighting both IS and Assad. But the Turkish government views the Kurds as enemies and is bombing them. The Turks have largely avoided attacking IS until now because the jihadist group was fighting Assad and the Kurds. But increasingly, IS forces are now also a Turkish target, just as they are for the Russians. But unlike Erdogan, Vladimir Putin continues to view Assad as a friend. The Russians want to keep the Syrian dictator in power, something the Turks don't want. Alan, <laughs> I mean, the question that begs when you watch that report is that, you know, from the, from the European perspective, who are our friends in this volatile region yeah, well, this, this, this uh, quite, I don't want to <laughs> criticise the people I'm, you know, <laughs> who have me on as a guest, but you're making it sound more complicated than it is. Uh, basically, there are two sides to this. There is uh, Assad supported by the Russians and the Iranians and Hezbollah and the people fighting against Assad. And amongst the people fighting against Assad, there are more or less nice guys who are on our side. Not all of them are very nice, but more or less. And then there are, and then there are sort of the real villains of the piece who are IS, who we have to keep out of, who we have to fight while at the same time fighting against Assad, and who's Turkey's helping. And on the Kurdish side, again, it's not just the, 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 the Kurds, as far as they're fighting against Assad, fine, but amongst them there are really bad guys that the Stalinist terrorists of PKK, who are our enemies. We've designated them terrorists, they are, the, they are the enemies of, 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 of Turkey too. So it's not as, you know, it's not as difficult as, a, as, it, as you made it sound. But I, I, I think I would, I would like to give some, some historic um, dimension to the events right now because I think what's happening in Syria is in the end of a development that started in Tunisia, then Egypt, then Libya, in the end of this long line, was Syria. In the beginning, in Tunisia, after Tunisia, you thought, oh, that's easy to get rid of the tyrants in the Arab world, just have an uprising and kick them out and everything will be good. So that's called the Arab Spring. But what happens afterward is Tunisia is, is the... Uh, is, is, I would exclude this from the side, but 
situation in Libya got much worse than it was before with Gaddafi. Situation in Egypt got much even worse than it was under uh, Hosni Mubarak. So at the end with the Syrians, the poor Syrians saying we do the same, but the West were looking at the development saying, is that really a good idea? Aren't, haven't we been better off with all the tyrants on board in Libya and Egypt and all these places? So that's a very open question. So this is why they were just reluctantly supporting the opposition movement. Very reluctantly, because what will happen if Assad will be toppled? Good question, big question. Two final questions for Dea Akalchi gets the last word. The big question is, who is responsible for the climate of terror in Turkey? Well, I guess um, there are a lot of, I mean, political leaders, because uh, it's obvious they have uh, the right to change uh, the, the okay, developments. Okay, political, political leaders. A bit, then the next question, yeah, is Turkey on the verge of a civil war? Turkey is already in a, in a battle, in a, in a cultural camp, so I, I, I hope it will not go so far. Okay, Turkey is already close to civil war. I listened to that. That's, that's all we've got time for on Quadriga. Bye-bye. I've got to say cheers. <laughs>